beautiful fairies. My name is Clara May, but you may call me your fairy, Clary. Godmother! And welcome to the Fairy Tale Feeder's grand opening! Uh, screw this, I'm getting a beer. <sighs> what was I thinking? What fairy, what creature in all of Philando would go see a performance showcasing human media? Oh. <laughs> Ugh, serious? Would you stop appearing in fire? You're going to burn down the theater I spent years building! Oh, and even more years paying off the mortgage. Never! But yes. Give it time, people will come. But right now, I'm the only one in Philando who cares about human art, Sirius. Liking their art is fine, but I have no idea how you can like humans themselves. They're wild animals. Observe them from a safe distance, like you'd admire a siren's scales. But don't get too close. Other fairies just don't see humans the way we fairy godmothers do. But one day they'll understand. I know most fairies here think of humans as selfish and stupid, and they're not wrong, but we fairy godmothers see the good in humans! Like that one watching. Humans are watching me? Well, you said you wanted both humans and fairies watching, so I hooked up the theater with an internet connection. Internet? It's like a hidden camera for the humans. They get to watch us do literally anything as we go about our shenanigans, both on and off screen. Wink wink, nudge nudge. That sounds terrifying. So I'm sure it's safe! Come on, quickly! We've got a review show to film! The world of video games. So full of wonder, so full of whimsy, and so full of crap. But with all the bombarding headlines, corrupt studios, and mediocre releases, it's easy to forget just how beautiful video games can really be. Some say they're a waste of time, a gateway drug to violence, or a permanent lock on your virginity. But to me, that's not what video games are. They tell unique stories where you are the hero, exploring a whole new world beyond imagination. Something pictures and words can't do justice. And I'm not the only one who thinks so, as we see dozens of passionate artists and programmers bring us their unique video game vision. But passion doesn't always equal quality. This is where K.O. the Kangaroo finds himself. Blah, blah, shut up and let me talk. This Australian freak of nature was born from the cold depths of Poland, home to cyberpunk, whatever data was called, and the breeding ground of invasion, as it was created by a widow game studio named Tate Multimedia. They released a... a thing that was lucky enough to get a C- in terms of sales figures, but that's all it managed to accomplish, and it was enough to warrant a couple of sequels. But that's it! And then it died horribly and painfully until it got a reboot this year. We'll get back to that in a minute when my co-host decides to stop talking. Stop talking? What are you doing then? Being funny and charismatic. Maybe you should give it a shot. K.O. the Kangaroo was their passion project. But K.O. 2 did not impress gamers. So much so that the third K.O. game never made it outside of Poland. I really hate being so harsh on a studio like this, because you can tell they really care about video games, both their own and others. But the KO games just weren't very well made. Their biggest issues are beyond ugly character designs or sloppy controls. The problem is that they're bland. The games function properly, they work, but they have no personality, no unique world. But there's always a second chance. And they got their second chance with the K.O. the Kangaroo reboot from 2022. Because Tate Multimedia couldn't be bothered to see a real kangaroo, the reboot was released on May 27, 2022. Because humans are more masochistic than my mother in bed. Now, I'm surprised I forgot this game already. I'm still struggling to remember it. I want my money back. Yeah, apparently 
humans love mediocrity, what with your love of fast food and reality television. So in 2019, the hashtag Bring KO Back campaign began on social media. So the team went through a number of ideas for a reboot, including a remake of the third game, and even a combat-focused game starring a much older KO. But they eventually settled on a complete reboot. Which, in my opinion, was the best call in order to freshen up the series for modern audiences. And let's be honest, no one cared about the continuity of KO. There wasn't much to begin with. But is this reboot a lovingly crafted reimagining of a forgotten hero, or does it deserve to be taken out back? Get out your boxing gloves, my beautiful fairies. This is KO the Kangaroo. The game begins with... A spin of our favorite wheel! It's time to play... How do we start our story? Alright, give it a whirl and watch the story unhurl! Blah! Oh, I'm in a scream of nightmare! Our hero, Kao, is chasing his sister Kaya across this dark, spooky void. As this mysterious, threatening voice appears as a butthole of darkness. When he wakes up from his dream, Kao tells his mother, Marlene, that he believes this reoccurring nightmare is a call to find his lost sister and father. Because when you're the hero, random dreams always mean adventure awaits! The beginning wastes very little time with telling you to get out there and start your quest. But while it's implied your father and sister ran away to the same place, you're not quite sure where they ran off to just yet. The opening dialogue is strong enough to get just enough grip on the story to make sense of it. Oh boy, oh boy. Our first level is a jing jang jungle. Do we get to fight all sorts of vicious wildlife like, I don't know, anacondas? Maybe because we don't want none of K.O.'s buns, hon? K.O. is very bouncy, like you would expect a kangaroo to be. No more stiff, turning, and clunky punching like in K.O. 2. It's tight. Most of my enjoyment with the levels came from just how fun K.O. is to play as. He's also got a good arsenal of moves in his toolbox. He's got your classic three-hit combo punch, but also a roll that you can not only defeat enemies with, but also use to get around faster and even slide into hidden areas. He can whip with his tail for an aerial attack and stomp into the ground for a great blow to foes. Top this with an unfussy camera, and you have a game that is very easy to just pick up and play with no hassle. Ugh. Too troll. It's all your typical platformer schlockfest. I care more about the fact that his neck stretches to the heavens every time he enters a body of water. <laughs> Just how long can that damn thing go? You could use it as a ladder to reach one of Elon Musk's space stations if you wanted. Who's Elon Musk? A madlet who thought it'd be funny to try and buy Twitter. Twitter? I believe it's the only excuse humans have to be smarmy and obnoxious online. Throughout this tutorial, Kao sees visions of Kaya guiding him towards a buried chest containing their father's boxing gloves. You find your island's local fighting master, an old koala named Walt, who's shocked to see you wearing Kobe's gloves. Because he buried them himself due to the supposed evil power the gloves possess. So after learning some more of the game's mechanics, you arrive in Hopaloo Village, one of the game's hub worlds. There's four in total, Hopaloo Island, Hungry Jungle, Snow Mountains, and the Eternal Island. All of them are vibrant places with tons of goodies to find. Previous hub worlds and KO games were little more than streets and corners that existed only for cutscenes. Many of the parts of the hub world didn't even lead to new levels. You just got taken to a level select. It rendered the hub world pointless. Here, you can actually do stuff! You can buy upgrades, talk to NPCs, find items, and actually enter the levels by walking up to them. Wow, what a concept. I love Hapaloo Island. It reminds me a lot of Windfall Island from Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. It's such a charming location that almost feels just as fun to explore as the actual levels. Art design is absolutely scrumptious. I love the humble yet colorful tropical feel this island village has. Though I do have one nitpick with the hub worlds. They don't allow you to do any level in any order. Because each level requires a certain number of runes to get in. Meaning you could collect all the runes in one area but still not have enough to get to any other level except for just one. As for the story, it's pretty good for the most part. 
It's not groundbreaking, but the stupid stop the hunter from being mean plotline is completely scrapped. In favor of one with actual characterization, world building, and character goals that expand beyond stop the bad guy. I like that Ko's adventure has personal stakes as he's also looking to find his lost family and prove that he's just as capable a fighter as his father. I just wish that we knew more about Kobe and Kaya as characters. So we could be equally as invested in saving them as Ko is. The characters do follow common archetypes you find in these types of video games. Ko is the slightly cocky but good-hearted adventurer who stands up for what's right. Walt is the wise yet stern fighting master who mentors Ko. Marlene is the sarcastic and strong-willed but ultimately loving mother. You've seen these character types before, and unfortunately there's not much to make them stand out. Not to say they're annoying, that's what the previous characters in the previous games were. They're enjoyable for who they are. They just aren't characters that will stick in your head long after you've shut the game off. Now, as for the gameplay, we have a- Ahem. Allow me. K.O.'s gameplay is keeping up with the Kardashians' levels of basic in terms of platformers. You run around, collect the things, solve the filler puzzles, and platform your way to new heights of adventure. And whatever voice acting genre this is. No one saw? Phew. That was lucky. Wouldn't want that on Rootube. The platforming itself is serviceable, as nothing you do is technically unfair or repetitive, but a huge majority of them feel like YouTube videos, formulaic and timed to 20 or so minutes, depending on your definition of time. You get new power-ups as you beat the bosses like in every other game, and you use them to clear out more levels, collect more of the things, and smoke more of that WAHOO KUSH! As the woman said already, the vast majority of the levels are pleasing on the eyes, with that Toys for Bob looking art style, because some things never change. And it can be just as fun at times to get lost in the scenery and be reminded you could be doing literally anything else with your life! Do not misquote me. It isn't a bad look for the game. The colors are nice and vibrant in whatever technical terms you use. But it's not anything you'll remember in a few hours. It's good for the moment, and god Damn! Sometimes that's just what you need instead of being milked like a cow for JPEGs of hot anime women! See? I know what I'm talking about. If you like games like Crash Bandicoot or Spyro the Dragon, then you might like this one, as its gameplay is a less polished but still fun version of those platformers. The gameplay isn't mind-blowing and it can be a bit repetitive, but it's fun to just hop around the place and punch dudes. It's a relaxing, casual game, but the levels do feel much longer than they really are. Most of them are about 20 minutes each, but will feel a bit padded out. But it's never overly busy. The visual design is great, I love the colors they use. Very bright and lush, but never overstimulating. The chunky shape language for even stuff like waterfalls is especially nice. It gives the game a cool, playful edge without being too childish. Oh, were you waiting for me to be funny? That's okay, I, I need to recharge my brain cells. Which is why today's episode is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legend. KO is an extremely easy game. You won't die once. Health items are dropped with every enemy you kill, checkpoints are frequent, and the platforming itself is very forgiving. It does a good job of balancing platforming, combat, and puzzles, but none of those are challenging. Back to the story, and it appears that KO's gloves have a mind of their own. Oh, finally. We could not suffer listening to that boring old fart for a moment longer. So it's true. You really are corrupted. We do not know each other, and yet you are already insulting us? Maybe we shall get along after all. And I like the back and forth the gloves have of Ko. Their dynamic of a naive but optimistic hero and a sarcastic, possibly demonic weapon remind me a lot of Persidal and Rubilax from Wakfu, only not as funny or interesting. I think the reason why is because the gloves talk very briefly, almost to a point where I forget they're even there sometimes. We've been using these mystical, ancient boxing gloves on everything we've seen. 
No wonder why they barely talk. Because we're dead! Seriously, though. If these things are supposed to be like that tutorial companion, like Fee or Midna or oh even Nazi, why don't they say anything important other than useless exposition? Are we sure you're a character, or are you supposed to be KO's side piece? Could it kill you to get a sense of humor? It's punching all your good for you wastes of Kanga product! I know not making them chatty is for the best. Because you don't want to make them an annoying comic relief, but they're too infrequent. Imagine Banjo-Kazooie if Kazooie only talked like 30% of the time. You'd forget she was even a character. But it's worse here because they attempt to give the Eternal Gloves a character arc. Where they learn to accept their new role as Ko's friend and stop being so sinister and learn about love and friendship and stuff. But we don't really see that change happen, so it's kind of an afterthought. Anyway, one thing the gloves allow you to do is punch eternal crystals, which makes you shift realities where objects materialize for a short period of time, which can lead to some good timing-based platforming. With the gloves' power now literally in your hands, Ko and Walt go to find Kaya and Kobe, and uncover the mysteries of the eternal energy crystals corrupting the various islands and their local fighting masters, swaying them from their warrior ways in exchange for more mundane occupations. I like the mystery surrounding what the crystals are, where they came from, and the Eternal Warrior, who is corrupting all the islands. Then there's the dialogue, which is a mixed bag. Some jokes are pretty cute, especially the banter from Kao and his mean-spirited gloves. But most of the time, it's pretty lame, especially when they shoehorn in pitiful pop culture references. You need to watch less Tuk Tak, hon. Tuk Tak? Mom, you can't complain about it if you don't even know what it's called. Given K.O.'s dated use of pop culture references, because this is clearly a game for the drunken midgets you humans call kids, I'm surprised it doesn't have K.O. doing funny Fortnite dances. You'd think it'd be easy pickings, but you know what? The depth said, no, we have standards today. Just not every other day. Now excuse me, I gotta ward off the invaders. Just another Monday for them, I suppose. Anyway, Clary, what does this Kanga Dunga actually collect other than loose pocket change? KO is a collectathon game. You see a thing, grab the thing. However, unlike in previous games, where coins had all the use of a stone glider, coins actually let you buy items in this game. However, gemstones are the ones that don't do anything aside from completion bonus. Every level also has three letters that spell out KO to find. Collecting these unlocks new costumes for KO to wear, including a skin that makes KO revert back to his old design. Okay, I love it when games let you dress up like older versions of the characters. But you can also collect four heart pieces for more health, extra lives, which I assure you you will not need, and scrolls that reveal world building. Another thing you can find? Bonus levels. If you snoop around, you're bound to find an eternal wealth that will lead you to an extra challenge level. They range from slightly harder than the normal levels to not hard at all. But even if you're not going for 100% completion, they're a fun distraction. But one thing you absolutely can't miss are the runes that unlock new levels. Yet a big problem with the game is that runes are just given to you like candy. They'll usually be sitting out there in the open with no defense. The game is a piñata. Hit it a couple times and it just gives you endless streams of coins and lives. It's convenient, but not fun. Nah, it's just a KO Odyssey. <laughs> but we have enough runes to get to the first boss, the Terror. Who is the Terror? Who knows and who cares? He exists for us to beat up. And as expected for a first boss fight with a throwaway, forgettable villain, it's throwaway and forgettable. Here's the boss fight! to find out where these powerful crystals came from by talking to our good friend Gadget. Oh my god, mother! Tate actually listened to my whining and gave the stupid pelican a name! It's a miracle! What the hell are you talking about? We talked about him before? Scrappy would do 
I've kitted her out with some top-of-the-line upgrades. She's ultra-fast now, and 50% of the time, she walks 100% of the time. Oh yeah, let's talk about the kangaroo in the room. The voice acting. The voices themselves fit. They match the personalities and designs of the characters. The problem is the acting in voice acting. It's awkward. They just have strange delivery with... Abrupt pauses? Making for subpar performances that just make the conversations feel clumsy. According to the credits, all of the voice actors are English-speaking Polish people. So it's easy to assume that English is the second language of the actors. With that understanding, I sympathize. Learning a new language is already a challenge. But acting in that new language? All I can do is give props to the actors for doing their best. And for many of them, this is their first acting role. And the Polish accents do give charm. Keo's wonky voice acting gives him a lot of personality, actually. It's like he's this innocent little boy trying way too hard to be the cool hero guy. It's frankly adorable. Here they know me as Mink the Fashionista. I'm an influencer here. A style guru, you know? I feel sorry for your followers already. It's as if the developers only watched Birdemic and Polly Shore's Pinocchio and said to themselves, Yeah, that's what acting is. Let's make everyone act like that as revenge for making fun of us. That'll show them. Now, let's get introduced to the elemental powers that give your gloves different abilities. Fire is the most useful and is used to burn obstacles, melt ice, and power machines. Ice is used to freeze water while wind pulls objects towards you. You can even use the elements on the boomerangs to make fire, ice, and wind boomerangs to help solve puzzles and make platforms. The boomerang is a projectile that you have to grab one at a time, so it's pretty useless in big fights. In combat, you'll sort of magnify to the enemy closest to you. Sticking to the enemy until you change direction. Just wall up the enemy until it falls down. The more hits you land without getting hit yourself, the more your power meter will build up, allowing you to do a super punch that KOs enemies instantly. Oh, I said it! There's not a lot of enemy variety. You got your ground brawlers, projectile launchers, big bruisers, and that's pretty much it. Hapaloo Island, it's frogs, the hungry jungle, it's monkeys, rinse and repeat for every world. But despite the lack of diversity, the combat isn't too bad, actually. No fight drags on for too long, arenas are big and open, and yes, it heavily relies on repetitive button mashing, but it is kind of fun to rack up hits and unleash a big bash. The environments are where the game really shines. Every level is just so eye-catching, and the general themes are fun, too. From a juice factory, an icy slope, a secret science lab inside a volcano, a haunted carnival, it's not the most variety you'll get from a 3D platformer, but it's enough to keep you hooked. But before we can use Gadget's motorboat to leave for the next world, we have to say goodbye to Mom. Kale's all like, Mother, when can I live to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. No, Kao, those gloves are sus. But they are cool and stuff. Okay, fine, but make sure your dad and sister are back by dinner. Did the people who made Peppa Pig write this exchange? Or do people believe that all arguments end as easily as a game of one, two, three, go play in traffic? Now we're here at the Hungry Jungle. Walt says here we'll find Kobe's old friend, Fighting Master Jayabaya. But it turns out the old training grounds have gotten a bit of a corporate makeover. Minky, a pushy salesman, says that Jayabaya has turned the jungle into a factory that makes a drink called a Jayabomb. Which, when drinking, powers you up with super strength. And because they have the juice, they don't see the need to fight anymore. And those same mysterious crystals have appeared here too, how suspicious! So Walt decides the best way to see Jayabaya again is to destroy his entire factory and kill his employees until he comes out of hiding. Yeah, great way to get the guy on our side, Walter. Anyway, the platforming here is a major step up. The levels get way more creative in terms of theming. You're literally climbing up the corporate ladder, beating up every office worker in the marketing boardrooms. You even get to water slide down an entire tub full of juice. Destroying the entire production of juice is a lot of fun. It's that sense of mischief disrupting the order for chaos. <laughs> That's something I've always loved about video games. There's even a Crash Bandicoot style chase where you have to run away from a giant barrel. It's pathetically easy! Though what's distracting me more with this isn't so much the chase. Rather that this guy is named Gooba, but his name tag says Ed. Our next tourist attraction is Jaya Balam. Wait, no. Jaya Baya? 
whatever, who doesn't seem to be 100% upstairs. The only cure is beating him to death! His fight is simple as his brain cell count. Just him and every last one of the dinguses we've fought so far just rushing towards you like it's a ride to hell. So after we do the thing and punch him in his stupid face, he decides he's done being a moron and expositions the shit out of us. By telling us that blah 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 Eternal Warrior may or not have kidnapped Kaya and Kobe, but is also responsible for everything wrong with the world. Because of course he is. Why wouldn't he be? So after we punch out the juice of the guy with screws loose, Diabai reveals that the Eternal Crystals, big shock, are evil! The Eternal Warrior has something to do with not only the disappearances of Kobe and Kaya, but also the corruption of the islands and their fighting masters. So off to the frozen mountains to find the oldest one who has turned her fighting grounds into a spa. And like the last world, these levels are a lot of fun. Ice and snow levels are really easy to make annoying. But I think the reason why these work so well is that they don't go overboard with the slippery ice physics. And the levels have fun gimmicks. I like using the ice power to freeze over entire lakes and using the fire power to melt it. And finally, no more frustrating minigames or vehicle sections, thank god mother. Those were so boring in the previous games it could substitute for melatonin. What else is there to talk about though? Uh, the soundtrack is just okay. It's pretty bland, nothing memorable, but it's nice enough on the ears and they do fit very well for the levels they're paired with. But the sound design is excellent, aside from the random hiccups where it cuts out, each sound effect is crisp. Those punches are especially satisfying to land because of the sound effects that go with them. However, there are odd quirks that take you out of it. A pretty big one I had and saw with other people who played this game was that exiting bonus levels might cause the music to be cut off. nitpicky, but here's a few hiccups I majorly noticed. And I think that's the biggest issue with K.O. the Kangaroo. It's lack of polish. Er, polish. Not to a point where it ruins the game, but just these little flaws that are easy to forgive but difficult not to see. But this game had a small team and budget, so I'm not expecting perfection. My favorite level in the whole game is the Icy Slopes. Maybe it's my inner Rayman 2 fan, but I love sliding sections in video games. It's definitely the most memorable level for me due to its fast pace. And on to the oldest one herself, who has also been corrupted by the crystals given to her by the Eternal Warrior. And she's the best boss in the game. Still nothing to write home about, but I like using mirrors to deflect her projectiles. I like freezing her clones. And hey, I almost died on this boss fight and beat it back with one heart left, making it easily the hardest fight in the game. Because of course you're having trouble. Just let me play them next time. I'm good at the video games. <laughs> oh wait, I can't. Because of my stupid DRAGON HEADS! Luckily, the oldest one knows where Kaya went. The Island of Eternity. So off we fly. But uh-oh! Gadget forgot to give us seat belts. So we crash land away from our friends. But the good news is we found the plane that Kaya stole, so at least we're in the right place. Though I will admit, the Eternal Island is my least favorite world. It's not bad, but it's bland. It's just more of the same stuff you already got. I really dig the spooky carnival theme, just not a fan of the funhouse hallways. Uh, I get lost in these more than I should. But we found Kaya! Who tells us our cursed gloves can help destroy the eternal world. Apparently these evil gloves aren't so bad as they suck up eternal power, and even Kobe's on the island too. So we punch our way through mine shafts and fairgrounds and come face to face with the eternal warrior himself. And while this game has already been pretty corny, well, there's a plot twist. Prepare yourselves for a marvelous show. Standing before you, we have the Mountain of Muscles, the Tower of Power, the Beaver of Rome. I know, it can't be. 
happy. Dad, but I don't understand. I've been rooting for you, K.O., and waiting for this moment, your reunion with your dad. What's the problem? Aren't you glad to see him? What have you done to him? Oh, he did this to himself. He was stupid enough to come here without the gloves. And as you may have realized, I need them. Uh, that's right! Minky is the eternal warrior! And his hat is alive and also evil! Okay! Minky is envious that he didn't get to train under the masters to become a warrior. So he used the crystals to corrupt them as petty revenge for his rejection. And he needs the gloves too, you guessed it! Once we wear those gloves, the whole world will bow to us. The Pinky and the Brain! Yes, Pinky and the Brain! Though I will admit, it is kind of funny seeing the innocuous merchant character turn out to be the main bad guy. They did something similar in Rayman Origins. And the Kaopedia reveals a lot of information about how he became evil. And just in general, going in depth about him as a character. I understand not overloading the game with dialogue, and I think keeping additional lore as an optional read if you like is a fine thing to do. I just wish we had more on-screen development with Minky. And by the laws of comedy and family circuses, Chaos Daddy Man is the final boss. To no one's surprise. Uh, and guess what? He's the worst boss in the entire game. Just like my dad. All you got to do is knock the wind out of him, stone him with boulders and shenanigans until you get to the next phase, where the hat exaggerates Papa's inflation fetish and he becomes Mega Chunk. So in order to help him exercise and get back down to a civilized weight, you gotta use all the gimmicks and elemental powers you learned along the way to do the thing and help Daddy get his weight loss surgery. Big. Freaking. Hoorah! What an underwhelming finale. Not just the boss. The ending's pretty weird too. We return Kobe back to normal and Minky... gets no real punishment. Ko is very forgiving and tells Minky he can become a fighter if he tries, which is very nice, but we don't see it happen. Minky just disappears. He's not arrested or anything, they just take away his evil hat. As soon as the gang returns home, we can fairly assume Minky just keeps on doing evil unchecked. Good job, heroes! So the gloves learn the magic of friendship, your mom chews your ear off, and the game... stops. It just cuts to the credits and then boots you back to the menu. What an adventure. I sure did enjoy my time through the Outback. I got to order me a blooming onion and everything. It was delicious and only $7.99. What a bargain! Kale the Kangaroo is a simple, likable platformer. It doesn't do anything revolutionary, but what it does, it does quite well. While this game is still your basic 3D platformer, it's still well made, charming in that goofy and awkward way, and painless to play. The art style is vibrant, the level design is satisfying, the combat is fluid, and the story and characters have just the right amount of cute campiness. However, it does have a lot of flaws. Like boring bosses, repetition, a lack of polish, weak voice acting, and a dull sense of humor. However, I don't believe the flaws, while plentiful, are bad enough to devalue the good bits the game has. I wouldn't recommend it over other modern platformers, but KO still has enjoyable blends of combat and platforming, explorative levels, and appealing character designs. I think this makes a great kids game with maybe some appeal for older gamers if you like the genre. If you don't like platformers, you won't like it. But if you're like me and do, well, I think you might want to give this game a shot. But most of all, this reboot does what a reboot should. It took everything about the original that didn't work and made it better. The biggest sin of the previous games was that they were bland. And while this game is straightforward and corny, it's not bland. Thus, it's a bright future for the kangaroo. Yes, but it's still a generic platformer. It's not worth rebooting when there are dozens of other franchises that deserve more love. Like Bubsy. But still, instead of trashing a failure, the developers made the failure into a success! <laughs> it's funny like that. Humans, despite their many mistakes, always pick themselves up again, no matter how embarrassing their species gets. Whatever. I'm grabbing a martini with extra unicorn urine. Wait, don't light anything on- You're paying for every last bit of this place. I don't have a job. 